So we should start. Welcome to this uh, conference. Um, thank you very much to Stephen Yablo to have uh, traveled uh, into Paris. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so today, um, Stephen will will talk about um, ha have a talk uh, which is entitled "Sense and Near Science," and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, I couldn't be happier to be here. It's an honor. Uh, I'm amazed it took uh, two whole days. I, it, you know, it, 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 in my mind, it was about two minutes. Thanks so much, uh, Jean Baptiste, for organizing this. Uh, thank you, Francois, who uh, can't be here, and uh, uh, Miriam and um, Rayanne and Louis. I really appreciate it, and all the other unnamed organizers. Um, anyway, and those of you who did show up from America, and those of you who didn't, I'm still kind of working out my relation to all this, you know, and there will be there will be consequences. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to, to, to all of you, and I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so we're going to start by talking about um, uh, really the, the, the so-called problem of logical omniscience, which is a very confusing name because it's really not at all clear there is a problem. Usually when there's a certain kind of theory that people were sort of tempted by, and then there's a huge problem for the theory, uh, that, that's called an objection to the theory, but somehow the, the problem of logical omniscience got elevated into like a problem for philosophy in, in, in general. I'm trying to, I wish I could think of a good uh, uh, analogy, but anyway, so we're gonna be talking about the issue of how it is that we're um, aware of some logical connections very incredibly easily. In fact, no insight is required seemingly in some cases, Whereas in other cases, it seems like a lot of insight is required. And in other cases, it seems like it would actually be a positive mistake to um, um, believe in addition to the premise of a logically valid argument, the conclusion as well. And so those are some of the issues we're going to uh, explore. This paper is mostly going to, in, in some broad sense, it's just like a very long series of examples with a, a few now we've shown. and. Here's the theory, but, it, but it's, it's, it's very much built around examples. All right, so sense and nescience. Whoops, something went around already. What are they? So I always try to get the audience on the, on the back foot by com coming up with a word that they don't know what it means, and I don't either, but I'm, you know, I'm like a step ahead in that. Uh, I, I know slightly more. So nescience is, at least as I'm understanding it here, and I guess the explanation is blocked on the, on the bottom. But uh, nescience, as I'm understanding it here, is, is something like sort of unawareness of logical connections. Um, or in some cases, it'll be awareness of logical connections, but reluctance to sort of do what you would think such awareness required. Um, so some of the, the, the I, may, I may have a formatting comment to make along the way every now and then. So far, great. So, the problem of logical omniscience started a while ago in, uh, as far as I know, maybe it has, uh, uh, well, I mean, it has, it has antecedents in, 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 in Frege, for sure. Um, but at least as we know it today, sort of an epistemic logic in this well-known book by uh, Jakob Hintika, Knowledge and Belief. And Hintika's proposal basically was to treat knowledge and belief and other sort of attitudinal operators as modal operators, quantifiers over worlds, and so believing something was standing in a certain relation to a bunch of worlds, all the, the idea would be you believed that P, just in case P held in all the worlds that were sort of compatible with your belief state, and you notice that given that you've got, say, knowledge being a modal operator, a universal quantifier over, over worlds, it comes out as all modal operators do, it doesn't really matter what the accessibility relation is, um, closed under entailment. Um, so if you know something and something else follows, uh, then you know that too. And importantly, it's not a matter of, well, you could figure it out. A lot of the discussion of sort of closure under various attitudes has taken the form of, could you draw this conclusion if you had your wits about you? But no, it's, you already know it. 
There's no possible, the semantics already rules out the combination of the truth of you know that P and you don't know that R. So it's clearly an admissible Indica says to infer he knows that R from he knows that P solely on the basis that R follows logically from P for the person in question may fail to see that um, P entails R. And we'll look at other cases where the person does fail to, uh, sorry, does see it and nevertheless sort of box, which seems exceedingly strange to describe abstractly like that. And this applies to belief as well, as Hintika notes, and even more so to the other attitudes, like say regret and desire, forgetting, perceptual attitudes. You know, I, I regret betraying my friend. Betraying my friend entails that I have a friend. I don't regret having a friend. <laughs> Dolliker's example is, you know, I want to get better, but of course, Getting, you can't get better unless you are sick, and so it's logically equivalent to, or so it seems, uh, I, I am sick and will get better, but it doesn't seem like, if, I, if, if indeed I want to get sick and get, sorry, be sick and get better, then uh, by this entailment principle, I want to be sick, which doesn't really seem right. Okay, it also applies, and this is what we're gonna focus on to begin with, uh, to the case where P entails R, N, R entails P, and I'll use Q for, for that case, because um, that case is interesting partly because it sort of lines up in a certain way with Frege cases, which we're all very used to thinking about. Um, so here's an example. I see that there's a star overhead, maybe. I see it in the night sky. I point to it. We all agree that this is something I see and I know. But of course, it's equivalent to there being a star overhead that there's... Um, a star overhead that is not burnt out in the time that it took the light to reach me. But whatever you, whether you think I know that the star has not burned out, it's hard to believe that I can see that the star has not burned out in the time it took the light to reach me, because, by, well, yeah, let me not try to explain that. So um, that's a case involving uh, perception. Um, the cases where P and Q are equivalent, and we'll, we'll focus on those for a bit, and then we'll slowly bring in Tillman back and then a few others. Um, yet only P is believed are, are something like Frege cases. Um, Frege equivalences are kind of locally sourced in that they have to do with sort of substitutions at one particular place in the complement sentences, whereas initiates equivalences, the kind we're looking at here, are kind of global. They're to do with how the words are arranged. Somehow there's sort of offsetting effects on the to do with these different arrangements whereby you reach the same result, but, but you can't sort of point to some particular place that a, a, a substitution is being made. Certainly though, there's a close analogy here. In both cases you have, well, because these two sentences are so intimately logically connected, it's very strange to imagine or to understand how someone can believe the one but not the other, yet it happens all the time. So it's a little bit odd that the literature is run on such different tracks. Omniscients tend to try to omniscientists tend to try to explain how P can be believed without Q, which is more like trying to defeat the appearance that it's impossible, which usually takes a semantic form, trying to come up with some sort of technical gizmo whereby it's not a contradiction to have the one belief but not the, the other uh, belief. Frege puzzlers tend to aim higher. They want to explain not only how we can, why it isn't a contradiction, uh, uh, but why we do sometimes believe P without Q, believe that maybe, you know, uh, uh, Hesperus appears at one time of day and Phosphorus at another time of day. They want to explain why it's rationally okay to do this, to have different attitudes to Clark Kent and Superman. And they also want to explain why it's sometimes rationally required to believe the one thing and not the other. Um, and this whole talk of sort of epistemic responsibility is not so common in discussions of omniscience. It tends to be more sort of an engineering problem. How do I hook up this machine if I put this like piece of my cognitive architecture on this table and this piece on this table, then maybe they won't notice each other for long enough that we can sort of say, well, that's why you know, there, was an, there was an uptake in this case. Um, and the higher ambitions on the Frege side stem in part from different takes on what believing only P, believing the one equivalent but not the other, involves. So Frege puzzlers 
tend to emphasize the content of the belief. P and Q express different information and we just believe the P information and not the Q information. We believe that um, Hesperus is in the, star, in the sky right now, but not the Phosphorus is in the sky right now. Omniscients have mostly construed the data differently. P and Q express the same information. In fact, there wouldn't be a problem of logical omniscience unless you were thinking of P and Q as expressing the very same information. Um, but P and Q sort of code somehow for different types of access. We'll see some examples in a minute. And we have only P-type access to the information, not Q-type access to the information. Of course, this lends itself to sort of solutions in terms of, you know, what is the cognitive machinery whereby we access information effectively when it's presented one way, but not so effectively when it's presented another way. And so I want to explore the prospects for informationalizing omniscience in hopes that it lets us up our game when it comes to explaining uh, and maybe even rationalizing um, some omniscience failures. The word failure sort of has a kind of a double meaning here. On the one hand, it could sound like, oh, you let the side down, you know, you failed. We were counting on you to be omniscient, <laughs> which already is a little bit puzzling. Uh, but, you know, you were supposed to be omniscient, and here you are believing P, but not Q. But, but you can think <laughs> of, it, it's, it, and, and there will be some, some aspects of that, too, but mostly, I mean, there's some closure principle, like, you know, you believe that P, P is necessarily equivalent to Q, um, but you don't believe Q. That principle will, will fail or, or be violated. So whether the, uh, the offender is the, the non-initiate believer or the principle that misdescribes that believer will be bear that possibility in mind. So believing P, of course, just is believing Q, by which I mean the two attributions are, are equivalent. When, so that D is the necessity symbol, when necessarily P, if and only if Q, they hold in the same worlds, if belief is relation, in relation to content seen as sets of worlds. So someone might, of course, say that what's really going on, and this is the standard line, we're a standard line in the... Uh, you know, it's the standard line in the omniscience literature. P and Q may signal different modes of access to the same information. And so here's um, a quote from um, Augustine Rayo and uh, Adam Olga. Elga. Um, a hacker needs to get information. This is like a completely obsolete sort of example for multiple reasons, but um, uh, <laughs> starting with the fact that the hacker already has the information is just trying to choose between the buttons of information they have. So a hacker needs to get information from the person at 555-5555. Um, people like you that work on fiction know that 555-5555 is the conventional stand-in for a phone number in all, in all fiction. One of, our, one of our favorite lines in the a book that we used to read to our daughter at night had this, had this uh, phone number and it says, my friend has the world's hardest number to remember. It's five, 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 five. <laughs> I keep on forgetting the five. <laughs> well, I'm talking about those kinds of things. <laughs> uh, he uses a reverse phone book to get the name. He's got the number and the name to, get in, the, to gain the person's confidence. He wants the reverse phone book not because it contains different information, but because of the way it allows them to access that information. So you, five, 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 oh, okay, it's Junie B. Jones, and you call the person and say, is this Junie? And then she says, oh, this is somebody I know. I mean, there, there must have been a moment that where you could gain someone, win someone's confidence this way. Um, so depending on our bookkeeping system, whether it's sort of a regular phone book or a reverse phone book, in which you have a, a list of numbers numerically ordered and then a list of names beside the numbers, um, um, the answer to like who's its person may be harder to find than the answer to what's her number, even if it's the same information both times. Um, but of course, is it the same information both, both times? And it's interesting that the way the information is rendered can matter. In fact, usually these kinds of examples are given with canonically different sort of ways of forming the sentence. Um, so the easy truths, P on the left, seem more within reach a lot of the time than the hard truths, Q. So I, I could say, uh, if I have a reverse, if I have a regular phone book, it's easy to figure out what Finkelstein's number is, 555-5555. It's hard to figure out who 555-555's person is, Finkelstein, but of course, yeah, anyway. Um, this is like a standard kind of, good. everybody knows like who does learns calculus, differentiation is really like easy. Integration is really difficult. Uh, but of course, the, 
the facts you come up with are, are really the same. I mean, if someone says, well, what's the derivative of x squared? You say 2x, that's obvious. Then if somebody says, what's the integral of 2x? Well, maybe that one isn't so hard, but in, on the whole, I mean, it would be for me if I hadn't just done that. But, um, but, um, but, but um, well, here's a simpler example. I mean, it's easy relatively to figure out that 11 squared is 121, but if I say, what's the square root of 121? It takes a little bit of thought to realize that it's uh, 11. Um, this is an example that's happened to me. It may not have happened to others. Uh, you know, you, you know, you're looking for something, and it turns out it was in your your hand the whole time. So you're looking looking for the the. I used to, I used to have this, like, I think I, I really kind of maintained a fugue state of having things in my hand. I almost I almost like compartmentalized on purpose because I thought it was such a sort of devilishly interesting sort of uh, possibility. I used to carry around pennies in my hand and say, where is that penny? <laughs> anyway, but this, this is the kind of thing that really does seem to happen. Uh, you know, you're looking for the remote, but you already found it, but you forgot that you found it, so it's in your hand. And so it's easy to, if someone says, what's in your hand? It's like, duh, you know, the remote. But if someone says, where's the remote? It might be hard to remember that it's in your hand, because you say, look, I'm looking for it. I'm looking, I'm looking, for, it. I'm looking for the remote. OK, so the question is, are P and Q only pegged to different modes of access, or do they encode? different um, information. Worldism, the idea that contents are sets of worlds, forces the um, access model on us, but you might think the info changes. So here's sort of more of a rhetorical than a logically valid way of sort of trying to change our orientation on this. Um, so the things that are called P worlds are really, we were told originally by David Lewis and then Robert Stonlicker picked up on this, uh, ways for the world to be. Um, such that P. I want to take this super seriously, more seriously than anyone ever probably in, intended. It, it, it emerged fairly quickly that Lewis didn't intend it very seriously. He just said, I call these great big concrete hunks of junk ways for the world to be with no ex explanation of why that would be a good name for them. Um, um, Suppose, as we're often told, that ways are best conceived as answers to how questions. And roughly, the relation is roughly the same as between amounts and how much questions, or numbers and how many questions, or uh, identities and who is it questions, things like that. Um, so here are two reasons that this could force a somewhat radical rethink of, of what worlds are, or what should be playing the role that worlds are called on to play. First is how answers tend to be phrases, like quickly, by holding our breath through the door, referring neither to concreta nor to properties. You're not referring to anything, probably. They're usually like adverbial phrases, prepositional phrases. Uh, Gideon was present with David Lewis. I now remember the paper I first like, uh, uh, trying to make this seem less implausible than it perhaps um, is right now. But usually when you say, you know, how, how, how are you doing? You don't say, you know, the answer isn't wellness, which would be a name for something. The answer is like, well, I'm doing, I'm doing well. But if someone says, okay, well, what does that stand for? Well, it doesn't really stand for anything. It's a, way of, it's a characterization of the thing. Um, also, and this is what's really gonna be um, important, how answers are expected, just like probably all answers, maybe, maybe, we could, we'll hear more about that from people who, who know about questions. How answers are, are expected to speak to the question? If someone says, how are you doing? And I say, you know, uh, well, and it's busy at Charles, Charles de Gaulle these days. That, that's not a really good answer because you, you weren't asked about uh, the airport. Um, so if, if you know, someone says, how did you escape detection? I, I could say by holding our breath. But I, if I say, and digesting our food, although, I mean, perhaps you could think of some context in which that would be inappropriate. <laughs> but anyway, on the whole, you're not supposed to stick in irrelevant stuff when you're answering a question. But worlds, as generally conceived, that just their whole like, line of business is to incorporate masses of information irrelevant to questions about, say, why a sentence is, is, is true. They, they kind of, yeah. So, suppose in an experimental spirit that the content of a belief that P consists of P's ways of being true. This is what sort of worlds would have been 
and an alternative sort of creation myth, like for, for Borrell's, where you took the way talk really seriously. So the content of a belief is its ways of being true and false. A way for P to be true or false is, uh, I'll use pi with an underline for a truth maker or pi with an overline for a false maker, and I'll often speak of truth ways or false ways, so I'm gonna go back and forth. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, say, pi underline answering, how might P be true? What would, be, what would a way be for P to be true? How would the world, you can almost think of it like sort of, uh, you know, there's a big literature on the bilocution, you know, how did you signal a turn? By sticking my hand out this way or that way. Um, think of it as like the world somehow contrived to make sentence P true. How did it do it? Just as I don't, when I'm answering, how did I kind of signal a turn? I don't say by sticking my arm out, sneezing and verifying there are black swans in Australia. Uh, how, how did you make it true that there are um, uh, uh, European democracies? You don't stick in extra stuff, but a world can't shut up. It always does stick in extra stuff. And in that sense, it's sort of like violating the relevance restriction on a proper answer to a question. And now this is like extremely unclear what it, what it means, but, and it won't get notably more clear, but it's enough to be getting on with. To believe that P is to think a true way is likelier to obtain than a false way. Um, now that has a lot of scope ambiguities. You might be, you might mean, you've got a true way in mind. You, you can think of a way that P might be true and you think, yeah, this is gonna be any false way. Maybe you can think of particular false ways and you sort of run off one-to-one -one competitions. Maybe you can't. Um, all these, this will be coming into play more and more. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, try to, try to make it out that this is more of a feature than a bug. Sometimes we hunt around for particular pies, truth makers, false makers. And this is, this is one of the main ways that omniscience failures arise. And sometimes we consider the pies as a class. So a bottom-up, top-down way. So, on the, let's talk about equivalence failures. Now, this is the easy part. Um, so a how possible explanation of equivalence failures. Well, on the worldly semantics for belief, I can't actually see what slide I'm on because, how do I get rid of this six. thing at the bottom, do you know? It's six. Oh, six, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so on the worldly semantics for belief, to believe P is, of course, to stand in a relational call it Bell, um, to uh, the content of P, the set of P worlds, uh, single uprights around P, paired perhaps with the set of not P worlds, P prime. Um, and then we've got this principle of equivalence, A believes P, then A believes Q, when they're necessarily equivalent. Um, that immediately follows, it doesn't take any insight, it's just there's no way out. It's sort of like if someone says, um, you know, I want to go to Hesperus, but I want to bypass uh, Phosphorus. The explanation of why you can't do that isn't, we don't have the technology for that. It's like, sorry, uh, the, the, there's a contradiction in the very conception of what you're talking about, and that's what's going on with um, violations of equivalence. Trouble is, of course, to believe X is not to believe. Um, I'm bad even at simple propositional uh, logical equivalences, so I hope this isn't wrong, is not to believe <laughs> if x then y, if and only if not the case that, that if x then not y, y. Supposing those are equivalent. To believe, <laughs> to, to believe a theory, see, I, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, this is one of the biggest challenges of this, of this talk is to sort of keep my enormous logical competence under a hat less, so I can display for you what it's like to make a logical mistake. Okay. Uh, uh, to believe a theory's axioms is not to believe their conjunction with random theorems, etc., etc. But suppose that belief, the belief relation that figures in the sort of semantics of believe that P, is instead a, a relation to, and that should be double uprights around P, which is a set of Truth, truth ways and the set of false ways. So this is what's sometimes called a thick proposition or a directed proposition. You just replace the worlds where P is true with the ways for P to be, P has of being true. You replace the worlds where P is false with the ways P has of, of, of being false. That's what that's supposed to, to mean. Um, then A believes 
P, but not Q. Well, first of all, there's really two kinds of how possibles we have to give. Uh, first of all, we've got to get past the semantical obstacles to being truly describable as believing the one but not the other. It's going to be logically possible, since if P is not the same uh, uh, thick proposition as Q, if P and Q, though holding in the same world, hold in different ways, omega, uh, then, of course, nothing stops us, as far as logic is concerned, from bearing the belief relation to just one of these sets and, 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 not, and not the other. But it's also going to be cognitively possible insofar as liking the look of some truth maker for P vis-a-vis -vis the, the, um, the false makers for P, so that should have a, a line on the top, is not the same as, okay, now here's something I was most proud of, liking the look of some, it says nine lower bar, nine upper bar. So I wanted to have a Greek letter that corresponded to Q. There isn't in the ordinary Greek letter, uh, alphabetical letter corresponding to Q, but there was briefly, before they figured out the Greek alphabet properly, uh, a letter, a letter uh, <laughs> called kappa, which is like, it's like a, an oval and a line coming out the bottom. It looks like a, a lollipop. So those nines are all lollipops. They're, they're, they're uh, kappas, and I was quite proud of that. I think it might have been a letter of Phoenician, I think, which was the, the first that, maybe that's why it's called phonetic alphabet. No, that can't be right. But anyway, Phoenician <laughs> provided, it's, or, or maybe it's really called a phonetic alphabet, if you're pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> uh, 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 the basis, I guess, for, for the original sort of non-pictographic alphabets. Okay, so um, it's certainly cognitively possible if you've got one set of truth makers here, another set of truth makers there, one set of false makers here, another set of false makers there, to um, find one of the truth makers here more plausible and to find one of the false makers there. So here's a, here's a really dumb example that people might have heard. So like a, a, a few years ago, um, people were like maybe, in 2019, so just to, to show my sort of um, uh, ugly American obtuseness to the cultural context, I'm gonna talk about NFL football about, about, about three years ago, like people would say, I was Google searching this, so it's, it's real. Um, uh, you know, the Patriots are gonna win the Super Bowl again, the, the New England uh, Patriots. You know, why did they say that? You know, the betting odds were about 0.3. Uh, the Patriots had won like about a third of the time since about the year 2000, which is incredible. You know, I mean, like they were definitely the you know the best the best team and had been for a long time. They won half the time since about 2015. Uh, why do people say, "Well, the Patriots are going to the Super Bowl again"? Well, you know, you look around for a likely truth maker. You know, Tom Brady throws five touchdowns and blah blah blah, and it seems pretty plausible. And you look around for like a possible false maker, and and it would be some other team. Like, oh, the Bills will finally get it together, or this other team. And that all seems less plausible. But now consider this sentence. All the other teams will lose the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you use, use that broadly, uh, where, where you count as losing if you don't even make it to, to, to the Super Bowl. Uh, that doesn't seem so plausible anymore because it's easy, because a truth maker for that involves this huge coincidence among the other 27 teams or whatever it is. But of course, they're, they're, they're necessarily equivalent. The Patriots win if and only if all the other teams lose, but nevertheless, the one seems a lot more plausible than the other, and this would be a possible explanation of why I'm getting way ahead of myself. Okay, so <laughs> one would like more, one would like to know why certain equivalence violations um, are forgivable or even laudable, and one would like to know this for other closure principles suggested by the worldly conception of content, and just to, just because they have such scintillating names and to motivate you, so you can just sort of like, savor this. They're entailment, conjunction, modus ponens, and implosion. Okay, so that, that's where we're going. So, like, hold on to your seats. Uh, okay, so the principle that Hintuka uses to get uh, the omniscience ball rolling is, of course, entailment. A believes P, then A believes R, where necessarily if P, then R. So, in other words, all P worlds are, are R worlds. Um, and this, unlike equivalence, is not forced on us by the worldly conception of content, because you have two different contents, so in principle, the belief relation could be born to the one set of worlds and not to the other set of worlds. But So you have to add a certain account of the belief relation, and in the worldly conception of content, it tends to be this. A believes uh, 
uh, the worldly proposition that P, if and only if every world compatible with A star exastic state, and nothing is ever said about what this means as far as I can tell, but that's probably a virtue in some ways if you're doing, uh, just trying to get the logic straight. Uh, every such world is, is a P world. Um, and now it does, entailment does follow because if the set of P worlds contains all worlds compatible with my belief state, then so does the set of R worlds because it's just a strictly bigger uh, uh, set. So entailment thus follows from the worldly conception of content and this sort of world-oriented conception of, of belief. Why is this an unwanted result? Well, to give a famous example, going back to Robert Stoniker, the uh, Seth Yeltsin has written about in recent years as well, and many people have written about. Um, William III, King of England, and it's incredibly complicated business. I think he, he was king in 1690 anyway. He grew up in, in the Netherlands, which is, you know, no bar apparently to being King of England, but a bunch of stuff happened. <laughs> okay, so William III thought England could avoid war with France. Um, this, is, this is Bob's example. But not that it could avoid nuclear war with France. Yeah. And I'm going to change the example because he didn't know about nuclear war. Although, in certain moods, actually, this would be relevant to something that's coming, in certain moods, in certain moods, I kind of feel like saying, well, if you believe it can avoid war and you know that phi war is a kind of war, then you believe it can avoid phi. It's more like, it almost feels like something pragmatic going on. It's like, oh, there's a kind of war I didn't know about. Maybe I should be more, more careful. Anyway, come back to it a little bit. <laughs> Um, so let's, ch let's change the example a bit. He didn't think that Eng England could avoid war with France and Spain both. This could be um, because he hadn't heard of Spain, which would be incredibly short-sighted given that your motto was 100 <laughs> years earlier. Uh, uh, or it could be that it just hadn't been much on his mind given that the armada was decisively turned back. My only personal experience of the Spanish uh, Armada was actually in France, going on a boat trip in Camper somewhere. The, uh, on this little trip, they could say, "Here are some cannons from the Spanish Armada that got." And I, I had no idea why there would be Spanish Armada ca cannons in Camper, but there are. I encourage you to go. Um, um, he certainly it seems quite possible uh, to mention a different style of example that we'll be coming back to that. This also follows from England can avoid war with France. Anybody out there, the King of France as it might be, who thinks England can avoid war with France is mistaken. That follows from England can avoid war with France, but he might not have certainly been as willing to sort of like assert that, and one reason might be he was less willing to believe it. Um, Adding to the mystery, so th those are some cases where entailment doesn't seem obviously right, but there are other cases where it does seem obviously right. So if William III thinks war is avoidable both with France and with Spain, then he'd better think it's avoidable with France. And this doesn't seem like it's sort of like an epistemic duty of his. It sort of seems like we can't even make sense of his believing that England can avoid war with both uh, uh, while wondering whether it's avoidable with France. Maybe sense can be made, um, but on the face of it, it's a very different kind of, kind of case. All right, so now we're gonna to try to explain entailment violations. I'm gonna give two different kind of entailment violations and explain them as best I can. So let P equal England will not fight France. P implies P sharp, England will not fight both France and Spain. But P sharp is not intuitively part of P the way that P is part of England will fight neither France nor Spain. England will not fight France is part of England will not fight both France and Spain. Uh, Spain. So believing P and something else does seem to require believing P, but believing P doesn't seem to require believing what I'm calling mere consequences of P, consequences that aren't part. So why would it be easier to balk at mere consequences of a believed uh, S than at a part? S with a little uh, zero on the top right, the worldly approach is no help because the set of S worlds is a subset equally of the set of S sharp worlds and the set of S not worlds. Wayward contents do better. So what does the belief relation look like if we are doing it with ways instead of with 
Morals? Well, A stands in the belief relation to um, the thick proposition, the set of truth makers and false makers, just in case A considers a truth maker likelier to obtain than a false maker. And then we've also got this notion of part, which I'm going to just sort of say, this is not a sort of complete account, but it, it handles most of the cases you'd think of correctly. T is part of S, if and only if each way tau upper bar for T to fail is a false way sigma upper bar also for S. So you might think like sort of, what is it for, um, you know, these apples to be part of this other bunch of apples? Well, um, each way for this smaller bunch of apples to contain rotten apples is also a way for the larger bunch to contain rotten apples. Okay, so trouble at the part level sort of ramifies up to trouble at the whole level. And so, and indeed, in the, the very thing that makes it the case that this smaller bunch of apples uh, contains rotten apples makes it the case that the larger bunch does. That I'm saying is sort of diagnostic of part whole uh, relations. And so I want to say T is part. So, so for example, suppose I say, why is, why is um, snow is white? or black not part of snow is white? Well, ask yourself, what, what makes snow is not white or black false? And it's gonna have to contain something that's against snow being white and something that's against snow being black. It, actually, let me change the example. Snow is what, not white or expensive. Um, so, so snow and tail, snow is white and tail, snow is white or expensive. But you don't, but it's, snow is white or expensive is the part of snow is white. Why? Well, a false maker for snow is white or expensive would have to involve both, um, sorry, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, snow is black or expensive. Yeah, so. Uh, there's a, a paper that contains the, the ghost of Tarski is still with us. Probably Tarski's turning over in his grave to hear me getting the truth value of snow is white. Wrong, but okay, so, so say snow is black or expensive, uh, a false maker for that is gonna have to knock off both disjuncts. So it's gonna have to sort of contain something about how cheap snow is, but that very factor in that false maker disqualifies this fact from being a false maker for snow is black because it doesn't do, take you even one further step down the road to seeing why snow would be black to mention that it's quite, it doesn't cost much. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of intuition here. So, um, so S believers believe parts of S, maybe, this is a plausible account, at least in many cases, if S is false ways, contain S naught's false ways as a subset, then if you've ruled out S naught's false ways, which might be a way that you come to believe that S naught, You've already ruled out S's false ways, because they're just some of them, right? So that would sort of explain why it would not be like a huge problem. Someone says, you know, clean the house, and they, and they say, and then you do it, and they say, clean the kitchen. So I just clean the house. You know, you don't, you don't have to do, do a further thing. Um, okay, so, but why would S believers fail to believe S sharp? Well, S sharp's false ways are true ways for England fights France and Spain. So case one is, William III is, has never heard of Spain. How is he to rule out scenarios that he can't grasp? Um, case two, he's been cognitively neglecting Spain. Um, he just doesn't think about it much. Well, then he's, no, he's in no position to rule out France and Spain forming a coalition, which England will then be forced to counter, because he hasn't been paying attention. So that, those are you know two kind of rationality respecting reasons why somebody might believe S and not believe S sharp. I mean, no doubt an ideal epistemic agent wouldn't neglect France, but an ideal epistemic agent wouldn't, uh, or sorry, Spain, wouldn't neglect anything. It's not irrational to like not pay attention to everything. Um, all right. So second uh, example, explaining uh, entailment violations too. This is gonna involve question relativity. Really, I should have done this in bits and pieces. Well, let me put this back so. 
Um, so everyone has seen examples like this. This is a little bit like, you know, for about three years you could, um, you could um, show the, 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 the video of uh, a gorilla in the room where people are throwing a ball around and they don't notice the gorilla. And people would say, holy cow, there was a gorilla there. And then since then, everybody knows there's a gorilla there. Uh, the, the, same, the same is also true uh, with this, these kinds of examples. This, this kind of example comes from an old wonderful paper by Larry Powers called Knowledge by Deduction. But here's the question. Are there English words ending in the letters M, T? And if the time lapse is small enough, you're supposed to think, I'm not sure. You might or might not think this. It took me a few seconds for it. Anyway. So, so let's just suppose we're in the group that can't immediately uh, answer that question. Um, so people can't say, well, were they not aware that dreamt was a, an English word ending in MT? I mean, if you said to them, were you not aware that they'd say, holy cow, dreamt is, you know, no, they already knew that dreamt was an English word. Like it was not, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that was sort of buried away. I mean, people, you know, they probably have used the word themselves. They, they, they probably knew how it, how it was spelled, although now that I, I'm sounding it out to myself, I do feel a small urge to put a P between the M and the T. But nevertheless, it's, that's how it's spelled. Um, um, they were, but the example didn't come to mind when they were asked in general about words ending in MT. It did come to mind when they were asked about the word dreamt, specifically. Does that example, uh, uh, I hope that example has some uh, psychological reality. So now it's true that you can realize things on being asked that you hadn't previously noticed. So I, um, so here's, here's my example. I hope it isn't wrong. Sally was trying to help me with this at the airport. So innovative is not pronounced like other adverb words, <laughs> like based on provocative, relative, evocative, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You'd expect it would be pronounced innovative, which is my defense for pronouncing it innovative until I was about 15. Um, but innovative is not pronounced like innovative, but you might, you know, and as soon as I ask you, you probably can figure it out fairly, fairly quickly, but it's not like you're remem it's not a case of remembering that innovative is, is, is uh, yeah. Um, and then I thought, oh, look, maybe it's because it's innovate, that's like, it doesn't end, provoke doesn't end A-T-E, but then there's relate, you don't say relative, you say re relative and so on, so. If you're like me, you won't be able to think about the philosophy anymore. You'll just be thinking about that example. Okay, so, um, so that's not what's happening here. You aren't discovering that dreamt, dreamt ends in MT. You're remembering a fact you already knew, and this connects up with our schema, believe sub omega. A believes uh, the thick proposition S, if and only if A judges a truth maker likely to obtain than a false maker. If we apply the famous Kahneman or Kahneman, Kahneman Tversky or Tversky um, availability heuristic, where they say if you, if you try to figure out whether a certain thing is a certain kind of ex thing is is likely, you judge it likely in proportion to the speed with which you can think of an example. So a sigma, a truth maker is judged likelier to obtain than a false maker, sigma with the bar on top, if truth makers are recalled more quickly and easily when A has asked whether S. So if you did not believe there is a word like that, a six-letter word ending in MT, um, it's because you were not disposed to recall a truth maker for there is a word ending in MT when I, when I asked you. But if I said, is dreamt a, a six-letter word ending in MT, you were disposed to recall a truth maker. In fact, I, I, I put it in front of you. It's not a mystery why you were supposed to recall it, but you were recalling it is the key thing. You weren't making it up for the first time. And this is a vindicating explanation. Um, so believers in an instance of an existential generalization, believers in FA who don't believe there are Fs, should take a bow in this sort of case. They shouldn't sort of apologize for their failure of omniscience. Facts that come, don't come to mind, even if you do believe FA but it doesn't come to mind, you're not, you're not supposed to draw inferences from facts that don't come to mind because you believe it. You don't say, well, I'm just going to draw this conclusion in, in hopes that I uh, have a belief that I'm not aware of that licenses it. Um, you know, it's like, you know, money you're not aware of having doesn't license going on a shopping spree, and facts you're not aware of believing don't license inferences to conclusions that follow from, from, the, from those facts. Okay. Um, okay, equivalence and entailment are single premise closure principles. 
Multi-premise principles are forcefulness too, if contents are sets of worlds, and belief is, or BEL is a matter of worlds compatibility with belief states. So I'll just mention three of the most obvious. Conjunction, A believes R, A believes S, therefore, A believes R and S, modus ponens, A believes P, A believes P only if R, therefore, A believes R. Explosion, if a bunch of premises conflict and you believe each one, then you should believe the absurd. Um, but of course, there's counterexamples to all of these. I can believe that X is parallel to Y, and I can believe that Y is parallel to Z. Um, even though I'm aware at some level that they can't all three be parallel, because I'm, I'm well aware of how X is not parallel to Z. We'll see examples in, it in a second. Um, modus ponens. You know, I can believe P, I can believe if P, whoever denies it, is wrong, while hesitating over whoever denies it is wrong. It sort of feels like that puts me into new territory that I'm not as comfortable with and I wouldn't want to sort of claim expertise about. Um, and then explosion, look, I can believe this happens to, I mean, philosophers of all people know that you can believe the premises of a paradoxical argument, uh, see that a, 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 a contradiction follows, while refraining from believing the absurd. I assume no one's response to, well, sorry, dialetheists aside, no one's response to a paradoxical argument is to say, well, so I guess, I guess uh, Sartre was right. Uh, life is absurd. Okay, that, we, that's not how we think of it. Okay, so is wayward belief any help in connection with these other sorts of omniscience failures, assuming for argument's sake that these principles really are violated? And importantly, we're talking throughout about static principles. In other words, it's not if you believe R and you believe S, can you figure out that, that R and S? On the worldly conception, you already do believe R, R and S. Really, dynamic aspects should be brought in uh, as well, uh, and they'll come in briefly in a sec. So we're, I only only have three minutes, right? Exactly. And how many, uh, do you know what slide I'm on? Or do you? 11. 11, okay. Um, so I may not hit every, every last thing here. Um, so I said that as a cognitive matter, A bears the belief relation to the thick proposition that P, just in case uh, A judges a truth maker likelier to obtain than a false maker. Let me slightly rephrase that in a way that makes the scope ambiguities a little easier to get a grip on. Let's let the deciders for P be the pies, either lower bar or upper bar, that actually obtain. Of course, it's going to be just truth makers that obtain or just false makers that obtain because P isn't both true, true and false. The deciders are true ways if P is true, otherwise false ways. So here's the idea that A believes the thick proposition and her best guess about the deciders is that they are true ways rather than false ways. And a lot is going to depend on how A comes up with her best guess here. And there's going to be two quite different strategies that she might employ. There's a bottom-up strategy in the Kahneman lingo that involves the availability heuristic and a strategy coming more naturally perhaps to philosophers, which is top-down, which is sort of like either an exhaustive search among truth makers or sort of looking for a property that the truth makers will have to have that lets you know that one of them must uh, obtain. So how in general do we arrive at our best guess as to whether the phi's, the deciders, are likelier to be psi, truth ways, than not psi, than false ways? So the bottom-up strategy is, well, you think what the phi's are likely to be. Here's the phi's. Ask if they are... Uh, psi, I should have said. Yeah. Or you could ask whether phi's are likely as such to be psi. And which of these you use depends on the case. So if I ask you, um, um, does the tallest person in the room wear glasses? You're going to use the bottom-up strategy. You want to line everybody up and see who's tallest and see if they wear glasses. Um, if I say, does the nearest sighted person in the room wear glasses? You don't line everybody up and try to figure out like who's the nearest sighted. I mean, you just sort of like the very fact of being that nearsighted is a reason to think you might wear uh, glasses. And now let phi b is a decider and psi b is a true way. How do you arrive at your best guess for the deciders as for whether they're truth ways? Well, again, it depends. Suppose I say the tallest person will run a three-minute mile today. So I don't try to figure out who the tallest person is and then say, hmm, I wonder, are you even going to run a mile today? No, I mean, the very fact of running a three-minute mile and that it's a person already tells me whoever it is, they're not going to run a three-minute mile uh, today. But then the tallest person will sneeze today. Then you'd use the 
bottom up method. I would line up people, figure out who's tallest, and demand to know if they're going to sneeze today. No, I'd wait and see. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to, I'm counting on you to think of a rationalization for I'm going to go like, yeah, so this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It better be good. It's on you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, Less questions. <laughs> what? Less questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so I'll just give. I'll give two examples. Um, I'll skip the, the middle one. So here's um, David Lewis's famous example of omniscience failure. He says, "I used to think Nassau Street ran rough." Um, apologies to people that have been to. Uh, Princeton and know how things run, um, because I'm just, uh, anyway, never, never mind Lewis's example. Here, here's my simple-minded analog of his example. Suppose that someone could believe, let's suppose Lewis believed, Nassau runs parallel to the tracks. The telephone lines run parallel to Nassau Street. If it follows from that, that all three are parallel. Uh, um, but why would, but could it be that someone doesn't believe that all three are parallel? How would you pull that off? Well, imagine that Nassau Street stands like the picture on the left to the tracks. The tracks are some distance away from Nassau Street, but you know, they're pretty close to parallel. The telephone lines are, the, are some distance away, but they're pretty close to parallel. So it's quite easy for you. The false makers for R and S don't exactly jump out. There might be one like, the telephone lines are like a foot closer to NASA Street here than they are there. Um, but that doesn't really jump out at you. Um, but a false making for the junction, for the conjunction does jump out when you combine the diagrams. You can, you can, uh, and I, I've, done, I've done this very carefully with, with uh, cartographic instruments. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it just turns out that the, 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 the tracks cross the telephone lines. So that's like an obvious false maker for all three are parallel. Um, and that's where I use a top-down method. Let me leave out the um, dogmatism case, but let me uh, do Sorites paradoxes and then, yeah, th th this is only uh, uh, three slides. Everybody can be abbreviating their, their, que their questions. Like, I, I suggest things like, how did you think of that? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So take an ordinary Sorites type case. So I've got a purely red thing here, x naught, and a pink thing, x n. I believe all the transitional premises. If x i is red, then x i plus one is red because they're sort of visually indiscernible, um, chromatically indiscernible. Um, so I believe a contradict. I believe things that entail a contradiction. Um, but I don't believe the contradiction. How is this okay? So here's one idea about this. I, I'm going to doing this w first with subject matter. What I should have said and did say on the slide that I skipped is, you can, subject matter is very closely related to truth makers. Subject matter can be considered a similar, similarity relation on worlds where worlds are similar. Uh, subject matter of S is a similarity relation on worlds where worlds are similar if they share a truth maker for S or they share a false maker. Uh, uh, for us, so the two things are sort of almost interdefinable. Um, so here's an explanation. Look, color claims are supposed to be observational. This is like, all you have to do is read Crispin Wright, who does a lot of genuflecting at, at, at the idea that color claims is part of their, their very essence, that you're supposed to be able to judge a thing's color, at least sort of standard colors, just on the basis of casual observation. Um, their truth about, their truth simplicity is supposed to be their truth about Observation, which is the relation that worlds stand in if they're observationally indistinguishable, um, which let's not try to figure out what, what that means. So to be true about um, the subject matter observation in our world is to be true, period, in a world that's observationally indistinguishable through our world. Well, given all that, the Sorites premises should be true since all of them pass that test. Red Xi, then red Xi plus one, is true about observation here because our world, because, because x and x, i plus one, are in a world observationally just like ours, cr perfect pro chromatic duplicates, because I can't distinguish them, so therefore they, it would look just the same if they were chromatic duplicates. So where does the reasoning go wrong if all the Sorites premises 
should be true and are true about observation, which was their sort of intended subject matter. Well, it doesn't go wrong. A valid argument is only required to be truth preserving, not truth about a given subject matter uh, preserving. For each PI to be true in a world that's um, and similar to the actual world doesn't mean that the conclusion C is too. You need the, the different worlds that witness the truth about the subject matter for each premise were the same world in each case. But you think about it, they can't be because if it was the same world in each case, that would be a world where this red thing and this pink thing were um, grammatically indistinguishable. It's different worlds in each case. Well, well, wait, wasn't truth about observation supposed to be truth for red claims? Yes, that was the plan and it would have worked had we played our cards right and remained in primary colored Eden. I was <laughs> looking around for uh, classical art that supported my hypothesis that everything was like clear, middle of the road, primary color in Eden, but there, there isn't much. Um, so, but it, there, were, there aren't any sorority se sequences in Eden, and so it would have been great. We could have let truth about red be truth about uh, you know, observation. The actual subject matter pulled apart from the intended one when we left. If the premises still seem true, that's because they are true as regards their intended subject matter. And, um, okay, so skip most of that. Um, it's just saying the same thing in terms of truth makers. But again, wasn't truth about these conditionals supposed to be truth about observation? Well, yes, in perfect days, there's supposed to be days better than which none can be conceived. That isn't how it is. We do go around saying that some days are perfect. It, see, it clearly follows analytically that there couldn't be. It was perfect, although there could have been another bluebird twittering in the trees. You know, you don't, that, that's a contradiction, but we still go around calling days uh, perfect. Um, so the intended, the Edenic subject matter is one thing. The operative subject matter may, if nature is unkind, turn out to be something else. Or indeed, we may not know what the operative subject matter is, because all we know is that the tended subject matter isn't going to work, but we're so embarrassed by this debacle that we just sort of try to keep ourselves in situations where the, where the intended subject matter doesn't lead to contradictions. Um, learning to live with an imposed subject matter can be painful, but it's part of growing up. We, of all people, should welcome this. It's one of the few parts of growing up that philosophy could help with. Realizing that you wanted to be talking about blah, but you can't. Uh, summing up, never mind. The end, thanks so much. Thanks.